Hi, this is Pastor Bill Cornelius. I wanna thank you for watching our YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe while you're here. And if you enjoyed the message, follow me on Instagram and Twitter, where I'm always posting powerful and inspiring content just like today's message. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Will Lewis. I'm the pastor of Brazos Fellowship uh, from College Station, Texas. I bring you greetings from Aggie Land this morning. And uh, so it is so wonderful to be here. What you might not know about Brazos Fellowship and my wife, Leslie, and I being here today is that the only reason that we are there in College Station, that Brazos Fellowship as a church is there is because of you guys, Church Unlimited, your sacrificial gifts have helped seed our church. It's really the reason why we launched. And I just wanna say thank you to you guys. <laughs> Woo, you're amazing. And uh, we've been there almost 15 years. This spring will be 15 years. And we have had the privilege of introducing thousands and thousands of people to a relationship with Jesus Christ because of the seeds that you've sown. So again, thank you so much for that. And we are just so honored to get to be here today. Uh, Bill and Jessica Cornelius are some of our best friends in the world. I am not kidding about that and have been for over 25 years, I think. A uh, long time, as a matter of fact, uh, I remember when Bill and I used to carpool together to go to seminary. We would meet early, early in the morning. It was still dark outside. We'd stop at this one little kolache place and get kolaches together and coffee and talk about someday, dream about someday, maybe being pastors of churches someday. It's funny to think about now, all these years later, I hope you have somebody that God puts in your life you can dream with like that because he has been such a dear friend to me all these years and just such a faithful and loyal um, servant of God. You are so blessed to have such good leadership at this church. And so anyway, yeah, praise the Lord for them. Awesome people. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about this amazing kind of auspicious occasion that we have, that not only are we starting a brand new year, but we're starting a brand new decade. Have you thought about that? Some of you can remember what you were hoping to accomplish back in 2010. So you're old enough to remember, like, what was I thinking back in 2010? And did you come close to that by 2020? Did you, did you achieve your goals? Some of you may say, I exceeded them. Wonderful. You are in the minority, I bet. You know, <laughs> most of us are probably saying, yeah, I didn't quite get it all done. And, but I think what I want us to do this morning is to think about how do we intentionally embrace this next decade? If we get that long, we don't know how long we have, but if we get another decade, how do we make the most of it? I know that's what most people are asking. A new year, a new decade. How do I get out there and make the most of this incredible opportunity God's put in front of me? Well, that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. And I wanna begin by getting you to think about a metaphor, that this new year, this new decade is like this prime piece of farmland that somebody just gifted to you. It's been given to you to plant whatever you want. You can grow whatever you'd like. So you immediately start working the land. You start cultivating it. You start irrigating, watering it, and you pour all these hours into it. But after weeks and months go by, no vegetables, no nothing is coming from the land. You know why? Because soil responds to seed, not wishes. We can wish all day long that maybe we would grow something, but really it comes down to the seeds that we plant in this life will predict the harvest that we're gonna live with into the future. And what's beautiful about this principle is that this was an invention of God all the way back at the very, very beginning when God was creating everything. In Genesis chapter one, let's go all the way back to the beginning of the story of all things today. In verse 12, this is actually the third day of creation. We're getting a little glimpse into what God was doing on the third day of creation, and then we're gonna to jump to the sixth day of creation, but I want you to see a common thread between these two days and what God was doing. We're told that the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit in, with seed in it according to their kinds. And it goes on to say, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. 
Do you notice this little common thread? There's this rule, there's this law that God puts in place right up at the beginning of creation that everything descends from its own kind, that everything both in the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom comes from its own kind that preceded it, that it comes from the seeds of its like-kindedness. Now, I want you to see today that this is not only true in the plant and animal kingdom, this is true in the human kingdom. It's true for you and I, relationally, spiritually, and in every other way in our life, that the thoughts that we dwell on The words that we say to one another, the decisions and actions that that perpetuate from our lives, that, that ripple out from our lives, they carry with them a ramification. They carry with them a consequence. They carry with them a harvest, a harvest. Now, Here's what I want you to see today. There's this principle that literally wraps from Genesis to Revelation throughout the Bible, all the way through the Bible. It's called the harvest principle, okay? Maybe you've heard of it before. It's a very simple um, principle to get your head around. It simply just says this, that you and I will reap what we sow. In other words, we will harvest what we plant in this life, that we will live with the consequences of our decisions. I'm just putting the same law in a little bit different wording, three different ways, but it's the same exact concept. It's the idea that we're going to have to live with the consequences of our decisions. And here's the interesting thing, that as a pastor, I get a unique perspective into people's lives and get to talk to them about what's going on in their soul, what's going on in their deep and inner lives many times. And what I find is it's super intelligent people, like highly educated people. Our church is four blocks away from one of the biggest academic communities in the state of Texas. We got like 65,000 students and, 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 and academics over there. Super brilliant, super intelligent people right down the street from me. But they forget this all the time. There are no exceptions to this rule, right? I see it all the time. People plant one type of seed in their life, hoping and wishing like crazy that they'll get a totally different harvest. And when we plant bad seed, we get a bad harvest. You plant good seed, you get a good harvest. It's pretty simple, but we, nobody's been able to outsmart this or figure out a way around the rule. It just, this is the way it works that the harvest principle will never stop being true. It will always be true. No matter how much we try to wish it away, not and even how much we pray, and prayer is powerful, and I encourage you to do it as much as possible, as much as we read and try to study and memorize the Bible, as many conferences we might go to, or online pastors we listen to, and podcasts we listen to, and Christian books we listen to, and watch, and listen, and, and, and read, all these things are really good, but they will not make up for the fact that if you're planting bad seed, you will get a bad harvest, that your future is going to come from your present, that your consequences of your future are going to come from the decisions of today. And I want to share with you uh, a principle that I think that goes along with this is very powerful, that you won't grow what you don't sow. You can't grow the kind of life you want unless you're willing to put in the work of planting those types of seeds today. I want to share with you a passage from the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, brilliant man. He's trying to help a group of young Christians, young followers of Jesus Christ, young believers, to to understand the correlation in this powerful spiritual principle And the sooner we realize this and the sooner we embrace it and make it our own, the sooner we can begin to use it to leverage it for God's glory and for our benefit instead of it always working against us. But here's what he says in this letter to this church in Galatia, the Galatian letter, chapter six, verse seven, here's what he says. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, don't think that you're gonna be able to get away with this, right? He says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And I would say, whatever she sows, that she also will reap, okay? This applies to all genders, all people, right? This is for everybody. 
But I love that he starts off, do not be deceived. Why? Because no matter what generation you're talking about, no matter how intelligent the person, everybody thinks they got a shortcut out of this. Everybody thinks, oh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? No! It follows you wherever you go. You can't outrun that harvest when you plant those seeds. He's showing us, listen, don't be deceived. And sometimes you may say, like, look at her. Look at the decisions she made. And it looks like she's just got off scot-free. Like, she doesn't look like she has any consequence. You know what? Sometimes because people have a lot of money, they can cover it up for a while. But do not be deceived. God's justice is not mocked. She will reap what she sowed. He will reap what he's sown, and so will you. Everybody ultimately will reap what they sow. Don't be deceived, he tells us. Just pay close attention. But I can't tell you how many people that will sow bad seed, that will sow one kind of seed, and they reap a horrible harvest that makes them miserable in their life, and they blame God. They go, God, how could you do this to me? How could you let this happen to me? And I have to believe that God is saying the same thing to us. How could you let this happen to you? How could you, how could you make these choices? How could you have planted that seed? We blame it on God, but it is our choices and our um, decisions, our seed that has created the circumstances many times that make us so miserable and make us so frustrated and can make the difference between a great decade and a bad one, a great year and a bad one. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, this is why it's so important. The best predictor of your future. Did you know your future can be somewhat predictable? It doesn't have to be completely random and haphazard. The, the thing that makes your, your uh, future predictable, the best predictor of your future is to ask the question today, what seeds am I planting today? What am I sowing today? to begin to pay, take a magnifying glass to every area of your life. What am I planting in my marriage? What am I planting with my children? What am I planting in my workplace? What am I planting in my spiritual life between me and God? Is it kind of non-existent? Is it like an arid desert? Is, there, is it, am I really working it? Am I really making, am I being intentional about this? Or am I just hoping for the best? It's so incredibly important and the reason this is so important, it's something that we ought to be talking about with our kids, our grandkids, our nieces and nephews, and anybody God gives you influence in with your, with your life to talk to them about the correlation between what they're planting and the harvest they're going to have to live with, the decisions they're making today and the consequences of tomorrow. And here's why that's so important. The reason it's so important is because it is so much easier to get into a harvest, good or bad, than to get out of one. It's so much easier to get into a consequence than to get out of one. Let me give you a for instance. Which is easier to get into? Uh, is it easier to get into debt or to get out of debt? Hello, right? That's a harvest many of us are living with for decades and decades and decades. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a bad harvest. It could be a good one. But is it easier to get into a bad marriage or to get out of one, right? We're in the business of saving marriage. We believe God can save any marriage, but I've seen a whole lot of people in some really horrible, horrible marriages, and it was super easy to get into them, let me tell you. But it took years and heartbreak and misery and suffering and lots of hard work to heal that and to see God do something in it. I'm just telling you, this is why it's so important. We need to think about it for us and for anybody else that God's put in our sphere of influence. How can we help them to see this correlation? It's so powerful, it's so important. Paul goes on to talk about this in the very next verse in Galatians chapter six. He says, it's important for us to think about the spiritual ramifications of this harvest principle. He says it this way, whoever sows to please their flesh or their sinful nature, their self-centered, prideful nature, right? We all have a sin nature. Paul's very clear about that. That even Christians, you know, you, even after you're born again, there's still a, a struggling to, to get Jesus as Lord of your life and not let sin take over. 
In, in uh, Romans chapter seven, he talks about the thing I don't want to do is the thing I wind up doing. And this is the apostle Paul. He's not just a Christian. He's an apostle, right? And he's saying, I struggle. This sin nature is trying to take over, but I have to continue to surrender to Jesus over and over and over. And this is what he's talking about. He's saying, you've got to be careful and intentional about the kind of seeds you're sowing. He says, so whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What good news is that? He's saying, listen, be careful, even in your relationships. If you sow to please the flesh, if you do things that are in the moment, it's just what your ego, your, your kind of uh, self-centeredness wants to do, one of the things I've seen that's so destructive in relationships and in marriages and in families is people gossip, slander each other behind their backs. And guess what? Isn't it crazy? Like we think about that only for like junior high and high school students and college students. And oh my gosh, let's be honest. Adults do that all the live long day. I'm telling you, I have seen so many relationships destroyed because of this. People sowing seeds of their flesh. That it, and it makes it back. Many times we think, oh no, they'll never find out. Nobody will ever know. But I'm telling you, as a pastor, they almost always find out what you said. And you, you wonder, I wonder why they never call me or text me anymore. We don't really ever hang out anymore. I don't, I don't really ever see them anymore. You know why? Because when they find out you've been talking about them behind their back, it erodes the honesty. Like who wants to be open and transparent and honest with you if they think you're going to go talk about them behind their back? You're going to run them down. You lose the friendship. It destroys. That's what he says, that the harvest of the flesh is destruction. Wherever we sow those seeds, it will slowly erode and destroy that part of our life. How important it is to say, God, show me how to sow good, godly seeds in this area. And if we sow to the Spirit of God, to honor God, he says, you will reap eternal life, joy, peace, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All the fruit of the Spirit of God begin to manifest in our life. And what's beautiful, I love how he puts this, that you'll reap eternal life. In other words, eternal life is not something that starts after you die. Eternal life can begin right here, right now. It's the idea that I'm going to begin to live now for Jesus. I'm going to begin to live now fully surrendered to him in every area of my life. And there is this joy that accompanies me. There is this powerful um, peace that comes along with me on this journey. And the harvest that comes is so life-giving to me and everybody else. He says, pay close attention to the type of seed that you're sowing. Now, just in case you're here today, which all of us fall into this category at times, and you say, well, Will, that sounds really good, but what if you already have like a huge bad harvest you're having to deal with? <laughs> if you're honest enough to say, I've made some not so great decisions in the past and now I'm having to live with the ramifications of that. I'm having to live with the consequences of those bad decisions in the past. What do I do now? Like what, what is the next step for me? So glad you asked. And what I wanna do is point to an illustration. Not often do pastors do it this way, but I'm gonna to point to how not to do it, okay? And we're gonna learn from somebody in the Bible that did it wrong and we're gonna talk about how to do it right. And this is the most, one of the most famous couples in all of the Bible, Abraham and Sarah, okay? It's found in Genesis chapter 16, and what I want you to do, I'd encourage you to go back and read the story in Genesis 16. It would only take you a few minutes, but I want to just tell you the story right now. Now, here's what happened. Sarah was in a bad place, ladies. She was low, having low self-esteem. She was depressed. She was down on herself. She was frustrated. This was back in a time in history where women's value and their worth came from their ability to give their husbands children. And she was barren. She could not have children. And she was so frustrated about that. And she didn't want to wait for God. She had already surpassed the time in life where she was a childbearing years. <laughs> it was way beyond that. And she was like, okay, Abraham, here's what I want to do. I want you to go on a date with my maid servant, Hagar, the Egyptian servant over here. And I want you to go and sleep with her and have a child. 
Well, let me just say something I probably don't need to say. Guys, always say no to an offer like that. Always say no. Always. Bad idea. Horrible, right? She's not willing to wait for God's harvest in this area of her life. She wants to plant her own seed and create her own harvest, and that's exactly what she's doing. So Abraham's like, okay, I mean, you know, if it'll make you happy, I'll do it, right? So he gets Hagar pregnant. And the entire time, that little baby bump's getting bigger and bitter. She is getting more and more bitter and miserable and frustrated. And then comes little Ishmael. And there he is running around the house. And she is driven mad, frustrated, angry. She can't stand it. She kicks him out of the house. She doesn't want him around anymore. And you know what's interesting about that? I see people doing that same thing right down to this day. They are so frustrated with the harvest, the bad harvest that they have produced in their own life. They think, you know what? The solution is let's move. I want to find a new job because I can't stand all these people out working around. You know what? I I can't stand this marriage. So I want a new spouse. I'm going to get a new spouse. I can't stand this church. I'm going to go find me a new church. I'm going to get new That's what'll happen. But here's what I found. It's so funny. It's not funny, ha-ha, to the person that's happened. But every time they move to a new place, guess what? Ishmael shows up. Hey, I'm here again. (laughs) Oh, well, I'm just going to find me a new spot. Oh, here's Ishmael. He's back again. Hey, how you doing? I'm not going anywhere. I am your harvest. Get used to it. I'm with you. For better or for worse, we're together in this life. When you keep moving from place to place and you keep finding you've got a bad harvest that's following you, over, you have to stop and say, what is the common denominator? Maybe it's not all these people. Maybe it's me, right? Maybe I'm just living with the consequence of my own harvest that I planted. And so let me give you three steps that I think can be super helpful to you. If you find yourself, because I have certainly been there, I have, I have had to correct some bad harvests in my life, and if we can all be brutally honest, I think we could all say, yep, guilty, right? Here's the first step that you have to do. You gotta own it. You have to take responsibility for the seed you have sown. And sometimes that means, ladies and gentlemen, that you sit down, this, this takes so much courage. It is so hard. I'm telling you, you got to swallow hard and ask God for courage, but sit down maybe with your children and apologize to them because some of the decisions you made made it hard on them. Some of the decisions and seeds that you planted have made it difficult on other people and you owe them an apology. And you just sit down and look them in the eye and say, I did this. You see, Sarah, she was miserable from her situation, but if she hadn't suggested it, it wouldn't have happened. She sowed the seed with her lips and had to live with it for the rest of her life. Some of us are in the same situation. We got to own it. We got to own it. It's amazing that if, if Sarah would have just taken a moment, repented before God and helped to create unity and peace in her own home between Isaac And Ishmael, holy moly, the number of lives she could have impacted for generations to come from the descendants of those two men. Oh my goodness. Powerful. What could have happened, but didn't. But it's time for you and I to own it. And here's the second part, is to go before the Lord. You have to repent and ask God to forgive you. God, I sinned. I didn't wait for your timing. I rushed ahead on my own. And I wasn't willing to wait for your godly plan for my life, and I tried to force my own on my circumstances. Lord, please forgive me. Ask him to forgive. And you know what the beautiful thing is? First John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What an amazing promise he gives us. Ask for it. He'll give it to you. And here's the third thing that is so powerful about your harvest. Even though it may not be great, God begins to go to work even in the hardest and and most difficult and bad harvests. Number three, look for God to bring good out, out of even a bad harvest. Later, Paul writes a letter to the the Roman Christians, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Maybe you've heard this verse before. I love the promise that lies within these, these couple of words here. It says that we know, we know, this is something we know, we know that in all things, God works for the good. 
Another translation says that God works together with those he loves for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. They love him and have been called according to his purpose. It's so powerful to know that God can work in all things, even real bad harvests, really bad decisions, Horrible, sinful situations that if we surrender it to him and say, God, I want your purpose. I love you. I want to live out that love. I want you to show your love through me to these people, even though it's really difficult. Really, situ- The situation is really difficult. This marriage is really difficult. The situation with these kids right now is really difficult. The situation at work right now is really difficult. But God, I'm asking you, that you would work something good out of all of this. Help me to plant good seed and not let the excuse of, well, it's already all messed up anyway. Why do I try now, right? Just throw your hands up and give up. Don't do that. God's saying it's never too late. I want you to know that the harvest can be shifted, but you gotta start planting different seed today. So let me ask you a question. Do Do you want to produce or create a predictable harvest? then you have to begin to practice selective seed sowing. Did you know that the future doesn't have to be completely random? It doesn't have to be like, who knows what's going to happen in the future? There's actually, according to Scripture, a way to make the future fairly predictable. And it comes down to what kind of seeds are we sowing now? We've got to begin to be selective about the type of seeds that we're sowing and, and really what it amounts to is us getting used to seeing a harvest and a seed, that every seed that we plant has a harvest that goes with it. Have you ever noticed like at Walmart or Home Depot or Target, any of those places that have like the, the plant nursery kind of on the side, if you go out there, they sell seeds out there and they're usually in a little packet, like a little envelope. If you notice, if you pick up the envelope, there's usually a picture on the outside, right? If you notice that? It's usually, if it's a flower, it's the picture of the flower. Or if, it, if the seeds are a fruit or a vegetable, it has a picture of that fruit or vegetable. What are they doing? They don't put the picture of the seed on the envelope. That's not why you're buying the seed. You're buying the seed for the harvest it produces, right? It's, it's going ahead and assuming you want to know what the end of the movie is going to look like before you start it right? You want to know where you're going to wind up at the end of this harvest before you plant it. That is so brilliant. That's so important. We need to start living like that. Teach our kids, play the movie, sweetheart. Think about it. If you make these decisions, they lead somewhere. It's very predictable. If you start sowing your wild oats, guess what? You got to live with a wild oat harvest for a while. Going to be ugly. Going to be painful. Just think about it. I love you and I'll walk with you through it, but it's going to be ugly for all of us. Don't do this. You will regret it. It's so important to teach ourselves as well as our family, those we love, see a harvest in the seed. There's some questions I want to give you that I think can be very helpful in this process. Before sowing a decision into our lives, pray and ask Jesus. Here's what I want you to to ask. Here's the first one. Will this seed produce desirable harvest in my life? Is this in keeping with what I think God, based on everything I know, and you may not be a Bible scholar right now, you may know very little about the Bible, but I bet what you do know when you begin to apply it to your life will help to shape what kind of seed that you know you ought to be planting. And and, and, and talking to other godly, wise believers that are further down the road, they've been walking with God longer than you, that that could speak wisdom into your life, that could help you to say, you know what, I would ask you to consider this kind of seed at this time of your life. To look at this, this could be really helpful to you. Because I've already been down that road and I know where that goes. And let me just give you some wise counsel. That is so valuable. Here's the next one. Will it move me closer or farther away from God? In other words, how do my decisions affect my relationship with my heavenly father? Because some decisions, as we think about, they're going to drive a wedge. And here we are on the front of a year, and many of us are starting to make the decisions of what's going to go into my schedule, what am I going to say yes to, what am I going to say no to, and are we going to live with just a cram-packed schedule with no margin, hardly any time, no breathing room, and we're just going crazy every weekend. I'm telling you, it's hard to stay close to God when you do that. It's hard to stay close to anybody when you do that, right? 
And that leads to the next question. Will it strengthen or weaken my marriage? This is an important question that people many times don't ask until the marriage is starting to, you know, many times, and I hate that this is true, but many times people don't, don't call the church until they're in such horrible, dire straits, crisis, that it's so bad. There's, 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 it's hard to put things back together. If they would have called us a year ago, oh my gosh, so much more hope. So much more could have been done. And I just want to tell you, it starts with the seeds that we're sowing. And here's the last one. Will it move me closer or bring me towards my goals or take me off track from what God has been doing and wants to do in my life? Is this the direction God's trying to help me to go? Or is this kind of like a distraction? This is a side entree, and it's just kind of getting me off focus here. I need to stay, keep the main thing the main thing, and I need to stay focused. Maybe some of you, the best thing you could do going into 2020 is say, I'm going to cut about half the stuff out of my schedule, and I'm just going to do really good at these things and stop trying to do everything. I can't say yes to everything and do well. I can only say yes to a few things and do well. And so I have to cut that out. What are those things for you? Now, for some of you here today, you would say, well, this is great for these young people that haven't destroyed their lives, but what about uh, those of us who've made mistake after mistake, sinful decision after sinful decision, and we're living with the consequences of all kinds of bad harvests in our life? I would say to you today, it is never ever too late to begin sowing good seed. It's never too late to begin sowing good seed. Came across this article recently that reminded me of this. These archaeologists unearthed some seeds that had been buried in one of the Egyptian pyramids. And they took them out. Some scientists planted these seeds that were over 2,000 years old, and they produced life. They began to grow. They had sat there dormant. They would sat there with this unlocked potential for over 2,000 years. So don't tell me it's too late to start planting good seed in your life. God wants to do good seed. He wants to do something wonderful in your life starting today, 2020. Everything can change, but it comes down to you saying, yes, Lord, I'm ready. I'm, I'm open. This is the time. This is the proper time. And I love how Paul wraps up verse 9. He says, let us not become weary in doing good because we will all have seasons where we get weary. Uh, trust me, I'm a pastor. I try to do a lot of good. I get weary sometimes, all right? We all get weary in doing good for at the proper time. I love this. You know, in farming, timing is everything. There's a time to plant Ecclesiastes tells us this. There's a time to plant, there's a, plant, there's a time to harvest. There is a strategic window of time that you need to do certain things. And now, right now, is a strategic time for some of you to do some certain things that God's putting on your heart. It's time to do it. It's a time to have that conversation. It's time to forgive that person. It's time to move on. It's time to, to, to start working harder on that marriage. It's time to really pour into those kids. It's time. The window is closing rapidly. Don't miss this opportunity. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. A reap a good, and what is implied there, it's got a good harvest. It's a righteous harvest. It's a blessing, not just to you, but everybody else in your sphere of influence gets blessed by this harvest. And today, I would just invite you to open up your heart to Jesus Christ to say, Lord, help me to begin to plant better seed in my life for a good harvest in the future. And what's beautiful about this harvest principle is that Jesus used it to be a metaphor for even how he came to bring salvation to us. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said this. He says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This is Jesus teaching that he was his father in heaven's seed of salvation brought to earth, that just like a seed is placed in the ground, he was dead on the cross and placed in a tomb. Three days later, he resurrected from the dead. And when he did that, he brings life to all people through faith and belief in him. 
that we now can embrace the God of the universe and begin to live out a life of planting seeds that will last for generations and generations, that we can begin planting seeds for eternity that will last and echo throughout all eternity when they're done unto him. Now, I just want to encourage you today to really evaluate your life, that you would be honest enough before the Lord to say, God, show me where the thoughts I've been dwelling on, the words I've been saying, the decisions and actions of my life. Show me where my seeds need to change. Show me where I need to begin to plant different seeds that could make an eternal difference, not only in your life, but in those around you. And maybe for some of you today, if you're honest enough to say, you know what, I have never actually asked Jesus Christ into my life. And today may be the day to say, Jesus, I want you to plant your seed of salvation in me. I want want to ask for your forgiveness and that you would be the Lord of my life and that you would plant that seed in me and let it begin to grow and help me to grow closer to you. And let this year, 2020, it's it's your, it's your, your, your year of beginning and growing and and expanding and embracing this relationship with Jesus Christ for the first time become his child, and let him move and work in and through your life in a way you never dreamed possible. Right now, I'd like to ask you if you would pray with me. And in this prayer, we're going to take an opportunity to say, God, I need you to help me with my bad harvest right now. I need to own it. I need to ask your forgiveness. And I want to trust you to do something good through it. And maybe it is that God's saying, it's time for you to reevaluate the kind of seeds that you've been planting. I want better for you, God says. And you want better for you. You can do better, and God wants to help you with your thoughts, words, and actions to plant better in this new year. And for some of you today is the day that God's going to plant his seed of salvation in you. Let's go before the Lord right now. God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you, God, that this is a turning point today for many in this room to say, yes, Lord, right now, all across this room, would you just be open to say, Lord, I got a bad harvest, and I'm asking you right now to forgive me for the decisions that caused it. And I'm also asking you to work something good out of it as I trust you with it. If you know right now, God is making it evident to you, there's an area of your life that's made you a bit miserable, but it's happened because of your decisions and it's time to trust God with it. Would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you right now. God, thank you for the brutal honesty happening from wall to wall all across this room. God, thank you so much. I pray for every person who's raising their hand, even those that didn't have the courage that know that this applies to them. God, I pray right now that they would trust you. They would ask your forgiveness. They would trust you with the future, trust you to work something good out of this bad harvest as we love you and work according to your purpose. You may lower your hands. And for those in the room right now, Lord, They would honestly have to say, I want a relationship with you, God. And I've heard about this before, but I have never formally, maybe you're sitting there saying, I've never formally asked Jesus to take over my life. I want him to plant his seed of salvation in me. I want his forgiveness. I want him to be the Lord of my life starting right now. Would you just pray right where you sit and just say, Jesus, please plant that seed of salvation in me. Forgive my sin. Be the Lord over my life like every area of my life. I'm giving it all over to you. You are the Lord of the harvest, and we are trusting you right now. And right now, in this moment of prayer, if you're asking Jesus to plant his seed of salvation for the very first time in you, you're asking him to forgive your sin and be the Lord of your life, I want to pray for you. Would you just lift your hand right now and say, well, that's me. I'm giving it over to Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. So many hands. Beautiful. Thank you, dear God in heaven, for the spiritual harvest we see happening even in this place right now. Thank you for your love. Thank you for blessing what's happened here today. And I pray you would bless every single person who is opening their heart up to you right now. Thank you for making them one of your children, that they now are a citizen of heaven. And I pray, God, you would use their life to grow a great spiritual harvest while they still have time. We love you, and we pray all this in the amazing name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys.